hello everyone. Welcome to another live stream on the History Valley Podcast. And today I'm joined by Professor Frank W. Hughes. He served in the Episcopal churches in Illinois, Pennsylvania, and Louisiana. And he has most recently been interim rector of Christ Episcopal Church in Nacogdoches, Texas. A graduate of Texarkana, Arkansas High School, he graduated from Hendricks College in 1975 of a major in religion. His Master in Divinity degree is from Seabury Western Theological Seminary. And he also earned the Master of Arts in New Testament and Early Christian Literature from the University of Chicago in 1981 and the PhD from Northwestern University in 1984. He was also a Fulbright Scholar at the Georg August Universität in Göttingen, Germany. He is a member of the Society of Biblical Literature and Studorium Nova Testamente Societas. He is Secretary Treasurer of the Anglican Association of Biblical Scholars, and he has taught New Testament and training programs in four dioceses of the Episcopal Church. He was Senior Lecturer in New Testament at Cordington College in Barbados in affiliation with the University of the West Indies. During his time in the Caribbean, he was an appointed missionary of the Episcopal Church. Dr. Hughes's research has focused on the letters of the Pauline corpus in the New Testament and how they used rhetoric. His work frequently combines rhetorical criticism, form criticism, and historical criticism in order to eliminate the historical situations in which Paul and others wrote the letters attributed to Paul. Dr. Hughes is the author of one book, co-author of another book, and author of 16 articles and eight reviews. Today's interview will center around one of those books, specifically the one he co-authored with the late professor, Robert Jewett, titled The Corinthian Correspondence, Redaction, Rhetoric, and History. The link to purchase the book is in the description below. Now, with that being said, welcome to History Valley Podcast, Professor Hughes. Thank you very much. I'm not really a professor, but um, but uh, I uh, I never had that title. But um, well, yeah, I did have it for a short time oh, okay. when I taught in. There you go. I, I was something called an assistant professor for a couple of years before I went to Germany, and uh, then when I was in Barbados, I uh, started out as a lecturer, and then I was promoted to senior lecturer, which is mm. I suppose roughly equivalent to an associate professor. So um, here in America, so uh, I'm also I'm a priest and I'm I'm the priest in residence at the Episcopal Church in Ruston, Louisiana, mm -hmm. and uh, our church is across Tech Drive from Louisiana Tech University. Yeah, I think I yeah I read that somewhere, and that's that's why I brought that up here. Yeah, that's it. Um, yeah. So this is what I'm doing in retirement. <laughs> so i'd like to start us off with this question how does one go about determining like methodologically speaking when you go through like first second first corinthians and second corinthians how does one tell when there's a break in the coherence it just, it just looks like that something was compressed how does one tell that well, um, we, uh, we practiced in our book, and this was Bob Jewett's part of the book, but what we did was, you know, we're, we're trying to look for evidence of cutting and pasting. And so what happens in our, our type of literary criticism, we give attention to the beginnings and the ends of particular sections, and then the content and style of those sections and then we look for transitions that provide a sense of the relation to each other. And so what happens is that um, what Bob Jewett did, it, I mean, second Corinthians, there is uh, not a hundred percent agreement that second Corinthians has several letters in it, but there, most people think most critical scholars think second Corinthians is um a pastiche, uh, and then the problem was 1 Corinthians. And so what we did, what Bob Jewett did, um, and this was one of the new parts of the book, really, which did not go back to his article in 
1978, was that he actually went through 1 Corinthians and looked at the text very, very carefully and looked for rough transitions. And where there's a rough transition, uh, that kind of gives you a clue that, okay, Paul is talking about this, and then now in this verse and for the next chapter or for the next few verses, he's talking about something that it looks like things are different. Uh, the, uh, it looks like that the uh, audience situation is different. And so uh, the Greek is different. Words are different. And especially what we really did look for was the situation was different. Um, and then if you were to, uh, if you were to read the discourse without that in at that thing that you think was inserted and you read it without that, what it, what you think was inserted and it reads much more smoothly without that, then that gives you a kind of a subjective understanding that this thing where there's a rough transition at the beginning of it, there's a rough transition at the end of it. And therefore, it looks like it was kind of pasted in. Um, and of course, the classic, did you ask about 1 Corinthians or you ask, you ask about both of them, really? Yeah, um, both. Both, really. For example, if you look on page 12 of our book, if you look at 2 Corinthians 2, 12 and 13, Paul has a narration of uh, his travels. And so in 2, 12 and 13 of 2 Corinthians, he says, when I came to Troas to preach the gospel of Christ, a door, open, a door was open for me in the Lord, but my mind could not rest. There was no rest in my spirit, right? Because I did not find my brother Titus there. So I took leave of them and went on to Macedonia. And then immediately after that, there is 2 Corinthians 2, 14 through 7, 4, where there's a new Thanksgiving prayer. And of course, Thanksgiving prayers are very important because the Thanksgiving prayer at the beginning of, of Paul's letters generally is where the vital theme of the letter is stated in the words of the great Paul Schubert. And so in 2, 14 through 7, 4, Paul is talking about something completely different. And then when you go to 2 Corinthians 7, 5, remember Paul had said he went to Macedonia and there was no rest in his spirit because he didn't find Titus. Well, now in 2 Corinthians 7, 5, he says, and even, we, even when we came into Macedonia, our bodies had no rest. There was no rest in our flesh. In other words, spirit versus flesh. Remember that? There was no rest in our flesh because we were afflicted at every turn, fightings within and fear without. And so the discourse that continues in 7.5 of 2 Corinthians follows very, very naturally on what is broken off at the end of 2 Corinthians uh, 2.13. Uh, and so that is the splice that is... Uh, the most persuasive one uh, in 2 Corinthians. And then, of course, in 1 Corinthians, the most convincing place where we talk about a rough transition is in 1 Corinthians chapters 1 through 4, Paul has raked the Corinthians over the coals at length, at great length, because of their divisions. You know, Paul has now heard of uh, Chloe's people who have said, well, some of them say I'm of Paul and some say I'm of Apollos. I'm of Cephas. I'm of Christ. Uh, and then he goes on from there. But then when you turn to first, excuse me, first Corinthians chapter 11, verses 18 and 19, Paul says something completely different about divisions in the Corinthian church. He says, well, I've heard their divisions among you and I partly believe it. And by the way, well, divisions are kind of necessary. That's how you find out who the genuine people are. See, that does not agree with the first four chapters of 1 Corinthians, we believe. And so uh, 1 Corinthians 11, 18 and 19 is kind of the linchpin for any kind of division hypothesis of 1 Corinthians.
And of course, that goes back to Walter Schmidthal's famous book, Gnosticism in Corinth, in the 50s. So basically, we look, look for rough transitions. What exactly is a rough transition? Well, there can be, uh, I just gave you an example of a rough transition where you have 2 Corinthians 2, 14 through 7, 4 has material in it and has a new Thanksgiving prayer, which should be the beginning of a new letter, really, generally the beginning of a new letter that doesn't fit what was said in 1, 1 through 2, 13 right. of 2 Corinthians. So we're looking at the situation has changed. Um the situation has changed and there are sort of different presuppositions about the situation in the two ends before the thing that has been pasted in. So in other words, when you take out the part that you think has been pasted in, has been inserted, then the, the reading, it, then it follows very naturally. Uh, and that's, for example, another place is, at the very end of what we call Corinthian letter E is 2 Corinthians 6, 11 through 13, where this is the very much the climax or the pararadio of the letter, where Paul says, our mouth is open to you, Corinthians, our heart is wide. In return, widen your hearts also. And then there is 2 Corinthians 6, 14 through 7, 1, which is just completely different, polar opposite different. And then if you take that part out, if you take 614 through 71 out and you go directly from 613 where it says, in return, widen your hearts also. Then you go to 2 Corinthians 7, 2, open your hearts to us. We have wronged no one. We have corrupted no one. We have taken advantage of no one. Um, and he goes on to say, you are in our hearts to die and to live. And so uh, that part of 2 Corinthians 6 and then 2 Corinthians 7, 2 through 4 sound extremely much like the very much of the climax of the letter, where there is not only a recapitulation of what Paul has been saying, but also an appeal to the emotions. So the rhetorical criticism where you talk about the rhetorical structures include in terms of the rhetorical arrangement of the letter um, confirms the uh, the uh, literary criticism uh, that we had done, that a lot of people had done. Uh, and then when I was studying with him in the, in the 80s, then I was doing rhetorical analyses of, of integral letters, you know, like Second Corinth, seven, Second Thessalonians, and First Thessalonians, and Bob was beginning to do a rhetorical analysis of Romans, which he later finished in 2007. And then yeah, I got the bright idea to say, well, now if you can look at the sort of how the the whole letter, a whole integral letter, is put together, could you also look at how a theoretically reconstructed letter is put together? And could this give you some hints as to the how the pieces of a theoretically reconstructed letter would fit together? And so we began to do that. Um, uh, and in a term paper that I wrote uh, in a in a class of his that I took, I did I I came up with the rhetorical analysis that became the rhetorical analysis of letter E. And, and before it was published in our book, I published it as an article. So basically, you look for coherence and you look for incoherence. How often does this occur in First and Second Corinthians? Well, in, in uh, Bob's chapter 3, he found 17... 17 uh, rough transitions in 1 Corinthians. Um, and they're all there. They're all there. And he, he names the rough transitions. And he says, after he shows how they would 
how the letter really should fit together, he essentially says, this is why we think this is a rough transition. Here is how the situation has changed. Here is how the language changes. Here the, here's how the rhetoric changes. So he found 17 rough transitions in 1 Corinthians. And of course, the ones in 2 Corinthians are well known. Of the between 2.14, um, between, um, in other words, the letter of reconciliation, which a lot of people believe in, is 1.1 1, 1 through 2.14 plus 7.5 through 16. A lot of people agree on that. Some people also put 2 Corinthians 8 as part of the letter of reconciliation, which actually, when I wrote my article, I did. Uh, and then uh, 6.14 through 7.1 is the very difficult part that says, go apart and be separate. Um, and there are these bad people out there and don't have anything to do with them. Um, and so that uh, 614 through 71 has occasioned a great deal of debate. Some people aren't even sure that that's even by Paul. Um, and then uh, 7, 2 through 4, um, 7, 2 through 4 is the end of letter E. Um, it's very much the climax. Um, and then, of course, chapter 8 of 2 Corinthians is a fundraising letter. And 2 Corinthians 9 of 2 Corinthians is a fundraising letter. Many people agree on this. And then 2 Corinthians chapters 10 through 13 um, is the reason why many people who don't otherwise partition 2 Corinthians do partition between the end of chapter 9 and the beginning of chapter 10. Because chapter 10 through through chapter 13 is a very tough, bombastic, sarcastic letter, which uh, it's very difficult to think that that would be at the very end of a letter that begins all about reconciliation. Uh, where Paul says in 2.4, in the letter of reconciliation, I wrote you out of much anguish of heart and with many tears, and then you got this very, very severe letter and it caused you a lot of pain. He had, talks about it there in chapter two. After the splice, he talks about it also in chapter seven, after seven, five. And so he talks about a, the very, very severe letter that caused Paul pain and it caused the Corinthians pain. And then would it really make sense for Paul to write another letter uh, that would be um, a very difficult letter to hear or to, to read? Um if Paul is trying at the beginning of 2 Corinthians, he's trying to affect and to, to cement into place a reconciliation. Um, it doesn't make common sense or it doesn't make rhetorical sense to put at the end of that letter four chapters where he's sort of kicking them in the behind. So uh, for that reason, a lot of people do indeed partition chapters 10 through 13 of 2 Corinthians because of the complete change in tone that you have between that and the beginning of 2 Corinthians, which is all about reconciliation. Does this also involve the frequent amens that Paul gives in uh, in his letters uh, in 1 and 2 Corinthians? It looks like he's ending several times. Well, when Paul puts in prayers, there would usually be, you know, the liturgical amen at, amen at the end of a prayer, yes. Um, you do see that, at the, particularly at the ends of letters. With usually at the end of a letter, there's a, a blessing or a prayer, an intercessory prayer. And of course, at the beginning of the letter, there is usually a thanksgiving prayer. And at the end of the thanksgiving prayer, uh, at times, there is an amen, yes. It's an acknowledgement that this is a prayer. So just how many letters are we talking about here total between 1st and 2nd Corinthians that were partitioned? The partitioning, the partitioning is how we interpret it, but we believe that there are eight letters and letter fragments. And we give letters to them, you know, like Corinthian letter A is the first one and the second one is Corinthian letter B and then um, 
the last one, the eighth is Corinthian letter H. So they're sequentially, you know, they're in order A through H. And then in chapters five through 12 of our book, there is a rhetorical analysis of each of those letters in order. So essentially eight letters and some of them are not, most of them are not complete letters. Um, they don't have a Thanksgiving prayer. Uh, they don't have the epistolary prescript. There's only one epistolary prescript in 1 Corinthians and only one in 2 Corinthians because there's only one, only one epistolary prescript, which is like Paul, an apostle to the Corinthians, grace to you and peace, etc. So when they were edited, that epistolary prescript was left on. And so in order to make them into two letters, ostensibly two letters, then the other epistolary prescripts and some of the Thanksgiving prayers were, were hacked off. And when would you date these many letters to Corinthians that Paul wrote? Paul, um, the earliest letter of Paul is 1 Thessalonians. And we date that, you know, Bob Jewett, of course, wrote a very famous book, A Chronology of Paul's Life. And when it was co-published uh, by SCM, it was called Dating Paul's Life uh, by SCM in London. And so he became a very famous as a chronologist. And so we date 1 Thessalonians, the earliest letter, in 50. Um, and Bob Jewett dates the death of Paul in 62 under under the emperor Nero. Uh, and then basically you have to figure out how many quote unquote missionary journeys Paul made and where, it, in other words, to date a letter, Paul has to be there in that church, you know, go into that city, found the church and then go somewhere else. And then there's some kind of problem. And then Paul writes to that first church. And if you don't know where Paul is going or where, you know, when he was there and when he went elsewhere, then you cannot really date the letters. But basically during the 50s is when Paul wrote his, um, all of his letters uh, until about the year 60 or so. Probably within just a very few months, Paul wrote his Corinthian letters. And what is the theological development in these many letters to Corinthians? What do you see happening like the main theological transition points? What is changing over time as Paul is writing all these many different letters to Corinthians? Um, I'm not sure that I see a theological development uh, in the Corinthian correspondence, I certainly do see a theological development between First Thessalonians and Romans, and I certainly see a theological development between First Thessalonians and Galatians, big time. In the Thessal in the Corinthian correspondence, I see uh, we see from letters A through H in our reconstruction, we see Paul in letter A saying, "Hey, I've heard there are divisions among you, and I partly believe it." And it doesn't seem to be too serious, see? Then in letter B, Paul has heard of the sexual immorality. Uh, and he has also heard that there are people who deny the resurrection. And so Paul writes letter B, uh, primarily about sexual behavior and about those who deny the resurrection of the dead. Uh, and that is the letter that Paul refers to in 1 Corinthians 5, 9, the letter that I wrote you previously um, about porneia, about uh, not associating with pornoi, immoral people. Then after letter B, letter B probably didn't work. Uh, and then by the time Paul writes letter C, he's gotten a detailed report from Chloe's people. He got, had gotten some kind of fragmentary rumors by the time he wrote letter A about uh, there are these people getting drunk in church, you know, and also that there's divisions, but it, Paul didn't think they were too serious at the time. By the time Paul, Paul writes letter C, he's gotten the detailed report from those of Chloe, Chloe's people. And he's heard of the slogans. I'm of Paul. I'm of Cephas. Um, uh, uh, I'm of Apollos. Apollos was the other, other apostle, uh, 
that was in Corinth after Paul, and then another party called who said, I am of Christ. Um, there, for four chapters, practically, Paul rakes them over the coals about the divisions. And then at the end of that letter, the peroratio of that letter, he basically recapitulates everything that is in letter C, which is about unity and disunity. He, but the stuff that's in 1 Corinthians that's not in letter C is not recapitulated in 1 Corinthians 13. But anyway, he says, you know, when I thought as when I was a child, I thought as a child, I reasoned as a child, I argued like a child. But when I grew up, I, I put away childish things. And that's what he wants the Corinthians to do. That's what first Corinth, that's what letter C is about. Put away the divisions, put away the the uh, strife and fights. And then after that, Paul writes letter D because he thinks letter C would have worked. It didn't. But he writes letter D, which is 2 Corinthians 8, asking for money. But letter C didn't work. Uh, and so it backfired on him. Letter D backfired on him. Uh, previously, he had said that the people in Corinth could choose their own people to handle the money. And then in letter um, D, he basically said that he would appoint people. That did not sit well with the Corinthians. Um, but anyway, it was a letter asking for money from the Corinthian church. And it's, it's not too clear that the money has been raised in letter D, 2 Corinthians 8. Then after that, Paul now hears for the first time that he needs to defend himself. And he writes a very subtle, measured, restrained letter of defense. And that is letter E, and that is 2 Corinthians 2.14 where a new Thanksgiving prayer begins, 2.14 through 6.13 plus 7, um, 2 through 4. That's a measured letter of defense. Paul has not defended himself up until now, see? And Paul got the impression maybe that didn't work. So then after letter D, excuse me, that was letter E. After that, he made the painful second visit to Corinth. And in the second visit to Corinth, Paul was rejected as the apostle by the apparently the majority of the people in Corinth, in the church in Corinth. And after that painful time in Corinth, Paul's second visit, Paul wrote letter F, which is 2 Corinthians 10 through 13, plus a piece of 1 Corinthians uh, 9, 1 through 18 interspersed in there. That's the, that is the bombastic letter. And we identify that as the letter of tears mentioned in 2 Corinthians 2.4. So then after letter F, apparently they got letter F and they, it actually was the big, he got them between the eyes and it actually did some good. It was the big Bertha. Um, and so then Paul hears that they have now repented. And then he writes the letter of reconciliation, which is 2 Corinthians 1, 1 through 2, 13, plus 7, 5 through, the, through 7, 16. That's the letter of reconciliation, where there's been a partial reconciliation, and Paul wants them to be fully reconciled with him. And then after that, at the end of the Corinthian correspondence, there is letter H, which is Paul uh, writing another fundraising letter where the church in Corinth, ironically, is not mentioned, but the churches of Achaia are mentioned. 2 Corinthians 9. Uh, Bob Jewett certainly thought that in 2 Corinthians 9, the money may well have been raised mostly. It would have been in precious metal and jewels, see? And Paul is concerned that when he and the people that he's going to send to travel with him, see, they're going to have to bring this money for the relief of the Jerusalem church in cash or in precious metal and jewels. It's dangerous. But anyway, he's going to do that. Paul thinks that the Corinthians are not going to fork over the money 
because some people maybe the maybe the reconciliation wasn't complete. So Second Corinthians nine is a different fundraising letter from Second Corinthians eight. It reflects a slightly different situation, and it may reflect Paul's relations, which seems to be pretty good with the churches of Achaia in contrast to the church in Corinth. So that's A through H. So we don't really see a theological a theological development so much as we see a situational development. Now, yeah, there is a lot of theology in 2 Corinthians. And in particular, if you really want to be waist deep in theology, just read 2 Corinthians 5, you know, 521. Uh, the most theological verse in all of Paul. Uh, For our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Man, you could spend a year just unpacking that. So, yeah, there's a lot of theology in uh, Corinthian letter E. Um, He is contrasting his theology of apostleship and being a Christian. He's contrasting that with apparently what the opponents of his say about being an apostle. We've got a super chat question. Tired talks. Thank you for your super chat. Did Paul ever meet the historical James? Can we trust Paul at his word? Yes. Uh, in the, in, uh, we know about the Jerusalem meeting, the Jerusalem conference in, um, Galatians 2, 1 through 10. And then we know about the Jerusalem conference from um, the book of Acts, chapter 15. Um, So Peter, James, and John were at the Jerusalem conference. Uh, In 2 Corinthians, excuse me, in Galatians 2, Paul refers to those guys as those who were reputed to be pillars. Did you hear reputed to be pillars? the so-called pillars of the church. Um, And uh, he yielded submission to them, not even for an hour. Um, So, yeah, I think there's every reason to believe that Paul met the historical James, whom he refers to as James, the brother of the Lord. And of course, in Galatians, you also have the Antioch incident where Paul confronted Peter Okay. Um, Damn, thank you for your super chat and the thumbs up. Appreciate it. So how many letters were partitioned in 1 Corinthians specifically, and how many of them were partitioned in the second one? Well, partitioning is what we say when we divide up 1 Corinthians and and, uh, divide up 2 Corinthians. And so... um, In 1 Corinthians, um, basically there are three letters, A, B, and C. And then in 2 Corinthians, with the exception of 1 Corinthians 9, 1 through 18, which we put between 2 Corinthians 11, 9, and 11, 10 in letter F. So uh, 2 Corinthians contains letters D, E, F, G, and H. So why was this done? Why did somebody or somebodies decide that they were going to partition all these many different letters that Paul wrote into 1 Corinthians and eventually 2 Corinthians? Why was that done? They edited the letters because, um, uh, and that's essentially what you would read in my chapter 13. Um but they did so and they did it in the late first century or early second century. They did it in order to, um, when you look at letter C, which is the frame letter of first Corinthians, you look at letter C, when you look at chapters one and two, um, Paul speaks about, there are people who have got spiritual wisdom And there are people who are Christians who do not really have the spiritual wisdom, like in 1 Corinthians 3, chapters 2 and 3. And so the division between 
Corinthian Christians who have spiritual wisdom that you see in 1 Corinthians 1 and 2. And then, of course, Paul says at the beginning of letter of 1 Corinthians 3, when I was with you in Corinth, I could not speak to you as spiritual because you were not spiritual then and you're not spiritual now because of the slogans, I'm of Paul, I'm of Cephas, etc. So letter C, as it stood, made a clear division in the church between Corinthian Christians who had spiritual wisdom and could really understand what Paul was talking about and those who did not. This would have been very, very useful in the hands of proto-Gnostics or incipient Gnostics. Bob and I don't, didn't, we don't believe that you have full-blown Gnostics like you have in the second century. So we disagree with Schmidt-Alls on that point. But we agree with uh, the position about a kind of a proto-Gnosticism. You have the building blocks of Gnosticism, which would become full-blown Gnosticism in the second century. Um, and that is the position that Hans Kanzelman took in his Hermeneia commentary on Romans. And so we agree with that position. And so the opponents, or what was happening, is that after Paul died, um, there were people in, I don't like the term Pauline school, but there were people who were kind of in charge of the literary legacy of Paul, who had access to his letters, most of his letters, many of his letters, in their unredacted, unedited form. Letter C was dangerous because of the division between the spiritual ones and the who had gnosis and the people who did not have gnosis, did not have the spiritual knowledge. And so what Bob argued is that there were pieces of authentic Pauline letters that were placed into strategic points in letter C and that sort of took away the sharp edges that suggested some people are spiritual and got the wisdom and other people don't. Because that letter would have been very useful in the hands of the Gnostics in the late first century and, and certainly early second century. So in order to take those letters, that letter out of the hands of early Gnostics or proto-Gnostics or incipient Gnostics, we think that the, the, the editing of those many Corinthian letters into first Corinthians uh, was done in order to preserve the good order of the church. So they thought. And, and when do you think in, all of that took place? Oh, in the ahead. late first century, in the late first century, early second century, the same point of view that you see in the pastoral epistles, First Timothy and Titus, particularly, is all about the order of the church. You know, in First Timothy and Titus, you no longer have apostles. You have the head honcho of the church who doesn't travel around anymore. Uh, the head honcho of a local church is the episkopos, the bishop, uh, or supervisor, or overseer. And then there are presbyters and uh, priests, presbyters, and there are deacons. And then in 1 Timothy, there's also widows. And so previously, during Paul's own lifetime, you had apostles, pastors and teachers, diaconoi, yes, um, and so you had a ver more of a variety of ministries going on that Paul does name in his authentic letters. But by the time Paul gets to, by the time of the pastoral epistles written after Paul's death, particularly 1 Timothy and Titus, not so much 2 Timothy, but 1 Timothy and Titus are all about church order. And the head honcho of a church is the episcopos. And Instead of multiple episcopoi, as in first, as in Philippians 1.1, 1, 1, where he says he sends greetings to the bishops, to the episcopoi, plural, and the diaconoi, plural. In first Timothy and Titus, there's only one episcopos per church. In other words, the monarchical episcopate. And that's what we see in Ignatius of Antioch, too. 
When you compare First and Second Corinthians to the other Pauline epistles, since Paul wrote so many letters to the Corinthian church, does it seem to you that Paul, for several different reasons, experienced a great deal of difficulty over the years in his life with the Corinthian church? Isn't it interesting in the book of Acts, in the book of Acts, Paul founds the Thessalonian church and it is only recorded in Acts chapter 17 that he was there and preached on three Sabbaths. Now, it doesn't actually say that he, that he was just there for three or four weeks in, for, in Acts 17, but it says that he preached in the synagogue on three Sabbaths. By the way, we don't know that there really was a synagogue. We don't. The, the old city is underneath the current city of Thessaloniki. So it's anybody's guess whether there really was a synagogue. There's a, that's a good question. But on the one hand, uh, in Acts, Paul preaches on three, on three Sabbaths in the synagogue. Whereas um, in Bob Jewett's uh, chronology, Paul spends 18 months in Corinth. He, went, he spends the winter in Corinth. And so isn't it interesting that in the Thessalonian church, the Thessalonian church doesn't get in much trouble. And, and they don't really get in any trouble if you don't think Paul wrote 2 Thessalonians, as indeed I don't. Whereas almost from the word go, as far as we can tell in Paul's Corinthian correspondence, whether or not you partition First and 2 Corinthians, but as we do, Paul, the Corinthian church is just in nothing but nothing but trouble. You know, one of the things that we don't know about Pauline churches is we don't exactly know how they worked when Paul wasn't there. Um, we don't really know whether, I mean, we know that some of them fell into error. Some of them fell into craziness. Obviously, Chloe, if Chloe's people weren't lying when they, when they said that they're by the time of letter C, and of course, in letter C, the Corinthians have written Paul a letter asking about being married versus being single. They ask about slavery, uh, et cetera. And that's what Paul answers in letter in 1 Corinthians 7. And the answers also continue in 1 Corinthians 8 and 10 about meat offered to idols. So they ask Paul about this practical stuff. But before Paul gets to the practical stuff in letter C, he gets to the heart of the matter, namely the Corinthians divisions. So as soon as Paul seems to have left town, as far as we can tell from the evidence we have, the Corinthian church just didn't stay together. You know, Paul was probably the glue, I guess, while he was there during his long ministry in Corinth. And perhaps from practically the moment he left town, uh, well, we don't really know when. But nonetheless, when you look at the Corinthian letters and you see how much, how pervasive the divisions are um, that Paul talks about in letter A and that Paul deals with at great length in letter C and that Paul defends himself in letter E and then Paul attacks them in letter F. I mean, this is a church that you would not like to be pastor of that church. <laughs> you know, this is this is a church where these people like to fight. I was rector of a church like that once. Got a super chat question. Tired Talks, thank you for the super chat. Is Simon Magus Paul? No. Simon Magus was a magician who uh, wanted to do magic in the name of Jesus, etc. So Simon Magus and Paul are two different, quite different people. Got another question. A Muslim apologist. Why are the Pauline epistles given much authority compared to the 12 apostles of Jesus? Because Paul's letters, Paul's authentic letters, are the first are the first writings that we have in the New Testament. Um, Jesus lived and uh, 
he probably uh, was born in five or six BCE and died in either 30 or 33 CE, probably 33. And so Paul's letters, Paul started doing his, um, Paul started doing his missionary work within months of the death and resurrection of Jesus. Paul saw the risen Christ, according to 1 Corinthians 15, 8. And so Paul's writings are the first early Christian writings that we have. Paul also wrote in Greek. Greek was Paul's mother tongue. And so the uh, it took a while for the uh, other gospel, for the gospels to have been written. Um, and uh, it took a while for them to be written and they underwent significant editing. Um, in my view, the, the gospels were not written until actually after 70. I don't date the earliest gospel, Mark, until after 70, um, after the temple's been destroyed. And then given that Matthew and Luke use Mark as a, as a written source, then they would have been written in the 80s and 90s. So Paul's letters are already in circulation in the early church before the Gospels were written. This is the reason that Paul never uses the term gospel to mean a written work, you know, like a written biography of Jesus. Paul uses the word gospel quite a bit, but he never uses it to denote a written work um, because they probably were not written by then. And so in Gentile churches, the Pauline epistles are, are in circulation. And then in the first letter written after Paul's death, Colossians, in Colossians chapter 4, verse 16, it says, well, look at the, get a copy of the, look at the letter that I wrote to the Laodiceans and see the, that you give them a copy of this letter and you also make a copy of the letter to the Laodiceans. So in Colossians 4, 16, that is um, that presupposes that the circulation of of Pauline letters in early Pauline churches um, was taking place. Um, so by the time of the seventies and eighties and nineties, the Gospels are being written. So the Pauline epistles were given so much authority is because they say so much about, well, the meaning of the death and resurrection of, of Christ. For example, Romans 5 is about the death of Christ. Romans 6 is about the death and resurrection of Christ and baptism, which is how Christians are incorporated into the death and resurrection of Christ. Chapter 7 is about sin. Chapter 8 um, is a uh, uh, about, well, among other things, it's about the giving of the Holy Spirit. And then chapters 9 through 11 of Romans are about um, about the salvation of Israel, where Paul says in Romans eleven twenty six, 26, all Israel will be saved. And so Paul's letters have a real serious theological content. Um, even the first letter, 1 Thessalonians, is all about the second coming of Christ. And also, um, for example, the Thessalonian church was a Gentile church. And in 1 Thessalonians uh, 1, 9, Paul says, you turn to God from idols to serve the living and true God and to await his son from heaven, Jesus, who saves us from the wrath that is coming. And then in 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 to 5, 3, Paul describes the second coming of Christ. So Paul's letters have a very massive uh, theological content for the most part, particularly Corinthian letter um, E, particularly chapters four, chapters three, four, and five, and six of Second Corinthians are deeply theological. Romans is very, very deeply theological. Galatians is very deeply theological about justification by faith and the circumcision controversy. So, Paul's letters were around for decades before the Gospels were uh, were even written and then later circulated. And when did Paul started when did Paul start writing these many letters to the Corinthians after he wrote first Thessalonians? 
it would have been after he had made his missionary journey to Corinth. And then according to Acts, he was there. He spent the winter there. And then Paul hears that there are these divisions. So it would have been in the early 50s. Early 50s. And when do you think the conclusion of his current of his correspondence to Corinth took place? It would have been after his second visit to Corinth. Um, uh, it would have been after his second visit to Corinth, and that would have been probably all of the Corinthian letters were written within a one or two year period, um, because Paul was, you know, Paul was there a long time, according to Acts. And then he uh, he heard about the divisions. He didn't take it too seriously. And then he heard more and then he heard more and then he heard more. He figured out he needed to defend himself and he did defend himself. And then he made the second visit, the painful visit. Then he wrote the nasty letter, letter F. And then he wrote the letter of reconciliation. Then he wrote another fundraising letters. So this took place over a period of probably a couple of years, could have been three years. We don't really know. It kind of depends on when that second visit was. Some scholars think that Acts of the Apostles is unreliable and cannot be trusted to uh, reconstruct the historical Paul. Do you think Acts is uh, generally reliable or do you also to a degree distrust Acts? Uh, I think that uh, I take the same position and Bob Jewett took the same position pretty much the same position as John Knox did in his famous book, Chapters in a Life of Paul, which was published in 1950 and was recently reprinted by Doug Hare. Um, but there, um, for the first time in either English or German, a scholar made the case that the Pauline letters are the primary source and anything else, including Acts, is a secondary source. And so when the primary source and the secondary source are not in agreement with each other, you have to, I mean, if they're in agreement, there's no problem, right? You don't have to rank your sources. But when the sources are in disagreement, you have to give greater weight to the primary source rather than the secondary source or rather than a tertiary source. And so that's what we do. Uh, and that's what many, many Pauline scholars do. What do you make of the uh, we passages in Acts? Because some scholars think that that could be evidence that the we passages belong to the hypothetical we document. And that could have been written by a, some think it could have been written by a traveling companion of Paul. And uh, some yes. going way back as B.H. Streeter uh, talked about that. What are your thoughts on there that? There have been a lot of British scholars who have been very interested in the we passages in Acts. Um, and uh, this, of course, gets you into the issue of who wrote Acts and was that person a protege of Paul? Um, but the problem uh, is that uh, as Richard Pervo uh, as, and others have demonstrated, that sometimes when there are narratives and then you have a group of people and they're traveling together and they start traveling, instead of I, the writer would write, the writer would switch into the first person plural, we. Um, and so there have been a number of scholars that have pointed out that little piece of literary style where you would switch out of the first person singular and as soon as you were part of a traveling company of people, you would use we. And so if that is true, um, then, um, then, uh, then I, I do not think that you can place that much uh, emphasis on the we passages in Acts versus the passage uh, versus other passages, because I think they're all secondary sources. So what I want to do is I want to read the primary sources first. And then sometimes the book of Acts has material that is partially or totally corroborated by what's in the Pauline letters and vice versa. And when what Paul says in 
Paul's letters and what Acts says about Paul are in agreement with each other, there's no reason to doubt it. But the, when the sources don't agree, you have to rank your sources. Do you see evidence for partition taking place in other Pauline epistles besides 1st and 2nd Corinthians? Uh, there are those who do. Uh, some people think that there are two letters or even three letters in Philippians. Um, and uh, a late, a friend of mine who was, a, who was just a wonderful friend when I was in Philadelphia, his name was John H.P. Ruman, Jack Ruman. He wrote a commentary. He spent a lot of years doing it, a big, thick commentary on Philippians. And he argued for multiple Philippian letters. Um, and then a, an East German, uh, Wolfgang Schenk, uh, wrote a commentary, and it was entitled De Philipper Briefe, not Der Philipper Brief, singular, De Philipper Briefe, plural, the Philippian letters. And so uh, Wolfgang Schenk, uh, along with uh, Jack Ruman, uh, as well as others, think that there are multiple letters embedded in Philippians. Philippians reads kind of in a, dis in a disjointed way as well. Whereas I think Romans is a perfectly good integral letter, with the exception of 16, 17 through 20. Um, First Thessalonians is a perfectly charming, wonderful beautiful letter, uh, integral letter, no breaks in it at all. Second Thessalonians is not by Paul, but it is in the Pauline tradition. And it doesn't have any interpolations or bits and pieces of other letters in it. Uh, Galatians is the same way. It's an integral letter. So I think you have to look at each letter and look at the literary characteristics of each letter. And you have to be guided by literary criticism and you have to be guided by form criticism of letters and what Paul Schubert argued in 1939 about the Thanksgiving prayer of letters and how they function in letters. So you have to look at each letter. You can't go in and read the letter. Um, you have, you know, without a, a fairly open mind, you have to look at each letter and see whether this letter as it stands makes sense. Uh, or what sense it makes, perhaps. And then uh, look at the partition theories, look at the reasons why you would want to partition them. And that's what we do in chapters two, three, and four. Uh, Bob Jewett did that in our book. And uh, look at the reasons for the partition theories. So the real deal is a partition theory is a theory. A unity theory is a theory. And so you have to look at the literary and rhetorical and historical characteristics of each letter and see if it makes more sense as, you know, one single piece or whether it looks like it's got pieces of other things embedded in it. Because Paul died in 62 or thereabouts. And we don't have the first manuscript of Paul until about the year 200 with Papyrus 46. So there's plenty of time between Paul's death and the publication of the Pauline letters. There's plenty of time for editing to have taken place. And what makes you and your late co-author uh, and your late co-author believe that Paul died in the year 62 CE? Well, you would really have to look at Bob's book, A Chronology of Paul's Life. The church tradition is that Paul died by beheading, uh, given that he was a Roman citizen and couldn't be crucified. He died by beheading while Nero was emperor. And so uh, the time that this makes sense, and Bob Jewett calculated it to a certain month uh, in the year 62. And so uh, I don't want to rehearse what he argued, but uh, he made a good case for it being at that time. But um, if Paul didn't die by beheading, if he did not die <coughs> while Nero was the emperor, then we do not know when Paul died. So we are we rely on the early church tradition that says Paul died while Nero was emperor. 
And in my closing question, what would your advice be to um, people that decide that they're going to take another read of First and Second Corinthians in light of this, of this discussion? What should they look out for to see clues of different of different letters? What kind of grammar should they be looking for? Well, I think that they should, at, in our book, at the end, you have Appendix 1, which is a list of the letters in order, A through H, a list of what's in the letters in order. And I think you should read it according to our partition theory. And by the way, Appendix 4 of the book is my translations of letters A through H. Uh, you don't have to go flipping and flipping and flipping for different letters. Just read it straight, starting with the beginning of Appendix 4, which is the end of the, at the end of the book. Um, and then you can also look at Appendix 3 at other partition theories, and you can see that there is a lot in common between our partition theory and some of the other partition theories. So I think that you should read it both ways. You should read it in the canonical way, uh, uh, you know, in the form of First Corinthians and in the form of Second Corinthians, like you got it in the New Testament. And then I think you should read it according to our partition theory. And that's really why I, I put that appendix in. It took me a week or so to translate through them. Uh, but basically to make it easy for you to read it and to read them in order and then to try to visualize in your mind what Paul was responding to when he wrote letter A. You know, when he wrote letter A, there are divisions, but they're not too serious. Also, people are getting drunk uh, in the Eucharist at, at Corinth. And uh, perhaps there is a thing about rich and poor. The whole issue of women and uh, short hair versus long hair, that's in letter A too. Um, and then letter B is all about sexual immorality. People thought they could do their own thing with the body because the body didn't matter. And then at the end of letter B is the long, long refutation of uh, those who say there is no resurrection from the dead because the body doesn't matter. So um, I would say read them in order according to our partition theory and then look at the other partition theories in our Appendix C uh, and see what seems to make sense. So I think you should, I think a student should read them both ways in the New Testament form and then in our reconstructed form. Well, thank you for joining me today, Dr. Hughes. Well, thank you very much. Um, the book came out, the book came out in October of 2021. And, um, you know, like a scholarly book of 370, 380 pages, it was expensive. It was $120. It still is. It's print on demand. See, so it's going to stay in print for a long, long time. Uh, and then you could get it as an ebook for $45. Well, now you can get it as a paperback book, which you have for $42.99. Um, and so it's more, ex and of course, a book that long uh, as a paperback book, $42.99 is not out of line. Um, I, I haven't made a cent yet in royalties. <laughs> um, be that as it may, be that as it may, um, you know, I think that you should, any of the readers should read it in our partition theory. Appendix four will help you to do that as easily as possible. And then uh, read it according to first Corinthians and second Corinthians and see if first Corinthians and second Corinthians really make sense. Um, see if it really makes sense for Paul to talk about divisions that are really bad. And then in chapter 11 say, well, the division is not so bad. Um, and then see if it makes sense for Paul to talk about re about reconciliation in second Corinthians one and two, and then to sort of kick them in the behind in chapters 10 through 13 in ostensibly the same letter. So see what makes sense. We do have a super chat question here. Let's just take this real quick before we head off. Jason Kukulu, thank you for your super chat. Pauline forgeries. Well, with the exception of the interpolation in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verses 33b through 36, it's all by Paul. Now, that is where Paul ostensibly says, okay, women got to be silent in church. 
which of course is in conflict with 1 Corinthians 11, where women have to have their heads covered with hair if they pray or prophesy in church, see? And also Romans, where Phoebe is the diaconos, the same term that Paul uses of himself and Apollos in 1 Corinthians 3, he uses that of Phoebe in Romans 16, 1 and 2. And of course, Andronicus and Eunia, Eunia being a female name in Romans 16, 7, and Andronicus and Eunia are well known among the apostles. And so um, you have to kind of, uh, you have to kind of look for, gee, is this, is this most likely by Paul or is this most likely by another hand after Paul died? And so I argued in my dissertation that Bob Jewett directed and disagreed with um, that Second Thessalonians was, in fact, a Pauline pseudonymous letter. Uh, it was written by somebody else in Paul's name. And of course, Second Thessalonians says, don't listen to anybody, either a spirit or an angel or a letter seeming to be from us that says the day of the Lord has already come. A letter as from us. Why would Paul in his own lifetime warn people about a letter purporting to be from us, us meaning Paul? So I argued that that was a Deuteropauline letter, uh, not by Paul, but by another. Uh, and I argued that there was a kind of a split in the Pauline, in Pauline churches after Paul's death. So, yeah, there are letters that are um, in the Pauline corpus that are not by Paul, and they include the earliest one, Colossians, and then the person who wrote Ephesians had a copy of Colossians. The person that wrote Second Thessalonians probably had a copy of First Thessalonians. Um, and then, of course, First and Second Timothy and Titus are pseudonymous as well. And of course, at the end of the Pauline corpus is the letter to the Hebrews, which is not pseudonymous, but is anonymous and certainly has a very different theology than Paul had. So, yeah, there's a wide variety of literature within the Pauline corpus. So I'd like to thank everybody for super chatting their questions. And thank you for joining me today, Frank. You're very welcome. And I hope we can talk again sometime. I'm I'm working on the Gospel of Mark right now, and uh, um, when I'm not working at the church, since I'm the priest in residence 30 miles away, uh, when I'm not working in the in the church, um, I'm uh, supposed to be work. I'm supposed to be here at home working on Mark. That's awesome. Let's talk about that sometime. Well, Hello, I've viewers. Written, Thanks I've for written. watching this video from the History Valley YouTube channel. Please don't forget to subscribe and hit the notification bell. And if any of you wish to further support this channel, please consider checking out this channel's Patreon page and becoming a patron. And or donate through PayPal or through Super Chat during the live stream. Thank you.